water. Well, let's start off with one everyone already knows. Here's our titular waterbending master, Paku. Where do you think he's literally the first person you see in Avatar history? This seems to be a koala otter. We know that koala sheep exist. What animal has the most hybrids we know of? Gotta be bear, right? Followed by pig, then maybe koala? I'm not one to complain, but can Appa fly any higher? What are you complaining about anyway? What difference does Appa's height make to you? He's still moving on that x-axis. Get out of here, Sokka. In this shot, you can see Aang lounging on Appa's head, the saddle being a significant distance behind him. But in the next shot, Aang turns around and seems to be right next to the saddle. I've always really liked the whole Appa's foot gets frozen so they go into a tailspin thing. It's just a cool way to take down Appa and it makes sense. If you watch this shot slowly, you can actually see Aang is only holding on to Appa's reins and it's getting flung all over the place. Sokka squares up for battle here in the background since he doesn't know really what's going on yet. Not a boy. He's looking for a teacher. Then what are we waiting for? Let's go get him! Patience, Captain Lee. Try Lee. There's a million Lees. The Northern Water Tribe. We're finally here. Yeah, you are finally here. You've gone through a ton of stuff to get here, so it actually felt like a journey. That's a good line. Once again, I love how bending is just integrated into even the most basic parts of this more bending savvy tribe. Why make a normal gate when you can just make an impassable wall of ice? Just more details that make the world feel really thought out. I really do like the whole Ice Venice aesthetic, but in reality, this would be highly dangerous, right? One wrong step with no one around it and it could mean drowning or hypothermia. Well, Sokka falls in in a few minutes, so I guess it's not that big of a deal. Moon continuity. We're at a crescent at the moment, and the moon's fixed and become a pretty big deal here in a second, so we're we're gonna keep an extra close eye. We also celebrate my daughter's 16th birthday. Princess Yue is now of marrying age. That's good. So, uh, you're a princess, huh? You know, back in my tribe, I'm kind of like a prince myself. Uh, prince of what? A lot of things. Man, shut up, Katara. He is kind of like a prince. As much as Yue is a princess, at least, he's son of the chief. Prince Sokka, baby. I'm thinking maybe we could do an activity together? Do an activity? <coughs> Very smooth. Hey man, she seems pretty into it, I don't know. Sokka got this way with the ladies. She's all smiling and leaning in and stuff. It's not smooth, but it works. Master Baku, meet your newest student, the Avatar. Just because you're destined to save the world, don't expect any special treatment. I do like the no-nonsense introduction of Paku. I agree, I don't think the Avatar should get any special treatment. Put him through the dredges, make him learn the hard way. He'll be better for it. For the last time, I'm not playing the Songi horn. No, it's about our plans. There's a foolish samurai war here. I'm taking your crew. Uncle, is that true? I'm afraid so. He's taking everyone. The whole crew? You mean Lieutenant G, Samurai Whack, the guy I assume is the cook even though it's a little mean, and the fan favorite, we, we need, need to, to stop. stop! I didn't know you were skilled with broadswords, Prince Zuko. I'm not. They're antiques. Just decorative. I love this little detail. When Zuko says they're just decorative, we can see Zhao check the blades for sharpness. Decorative swords wouldn't have a sharp edge, but of course Zuko swords do. Thus confirming Zuko is the blue spirit in Zhao's head even further. Have you heard of the blue spirit, General Iroh? Just rumors. I don't think he is real. We know that Iroh put together Zuko as the blue spirit at some point. So, the blue spirit. I wonder who could be behind that mask. But I honestly think Iroh knew from square one, and he's covering for Zuko here. Here, the women learned from Yagoda to use their water bending to heal. I'm sure she would be happy to take you as her student, despite your bad attitude. I don't want to heal, I want to fight! Hell yeah! I fuck with the energy, Katara! In our tribe, it is forbidden for women to learn water bending. All right, hold on one sec there. How backwards ass is this? You've been at war for a hundred years and you don't want to train perfectly good waterbenders? Hell, even the Fire Nation uses female soldiers. It does seem like this is consistent between both tribes though. Katara describes the men of her village leaving to fight. Two years ago, my father and the men of my tribe journeyed to the Earth Kingdom to help fight against the Fire Nation. While it seems like proper fighting age women stayed back to look after the village. It's lame on like an equality level, yeah, but I don't know, like also a logical level. I get that old cultural things are hard to show shake, but a hundred years of war? No female waterbenders? Give your head a shake. I didn't travel across the entire world so you could tell me no. No. Even though Paku is a sexist piece of shit, I do like how headstrong he is on his opinions. It's like a strong character beat, not that he's a good guy or anything. If you won't teach Katara, then... Then what? Then I won't. 
won't learn from you. I love this moment for Mag. I don't even really know if it's a character beat, because it's so in character for him to do it. Of course he'd stick up for Katara like this. They've been all over the world, through good and through bad. I guess it's just a moment that makes you feel good that you know these characters so well. Hey, how about that picnic last night? Boy, your dad sure knows how to throw a party. I'm happy you enjoyed yourself. Well, it wasn't as much fun after you left. Oh, hold on. He's got game. That was a good line. I'll meet you on that bridge tonight. Great. I'll see you now. Ah, oh, well, no one ever sticks to landing the first time. I'm very impressed. You all seem highly qualified for the mission I have in mind. If you look super closely in the shot, you can actually see the pirates from the waterbending scroll. Are you here for the healing lesson? So this water healing class raises a bit of a question with two of our White Lotus boys. Zhang Zhang says it as if it's a somewhat rare ability. You have healing abilities. The great benders of the water tribe sometimes have this ability. However, Paku says that every water bending woman in the village learns healing. Here the women learn from Yagoda to use their water bending to heal. I'm probably gonna side with Paku here and say that it's not all that rare, and it's possible that any waterbender could learn it if they wanted to. Since, you know, it's his culture and he would probably know. Are you here for the healing lesson? I guess I am. I've heard people say that Katara shouldn't be all downtrodden here, and that healing is good to learn too. Fuck that. She just got shut down on something she's wanted to do her entire life because of her gender. Healing is great and all, but I'd be the same way. I want to kick ass. Remember when Ang got water bending right away? I feel like people overlook this scene. You're moving the water around, but you're not feeling the push and pull. I'm trying. Maybe that move is too advanced for you. Why don't you try an easier one? <laughs> Ang got super basic movements right away, but when faced with a master in advanced movements and techniques, he seems to be struggling. Waterbending doesn't come as easy to Ang as most people think. So who's the lucky boy? Huh? Your betrothal necklace. You're getting married, right? Oh, no, I don't think I'm ready for that yet. My grandmother gave my mother this necklace, and my mother passed it down to me. The one time we actually ever see Katara's mom, she's wearing a betrothal necklace herself. We don't get close enough to see the design and we don't get to see little Katara's neck to see if she's wearing her own. Katara frames it as if her mother actively passed down the necklace to her. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that this necklace that she's wearing was made for her by Hakoda. Just a thought while we're on the subject of betrothal necklaces. I don't know why I didn't realize sooner. You're the spitting image of Khan. Why does you go to feel the need to get so close to Katara here? Give me some room, relax. It always freaked me out how close she got. The blasting jelly. The pirates are using blasting jelly, the same explosive jet used to nuke that dam way back when. These barrels are filled with blasting jelly. This moment is actually nuts. If you slow this way down, you can actually see Zuko bend a fire shield for himself. It's seriously like a split second. For the longest time, I always thought he just got engulfed by the flames of the explosion. But no, if you slow it down, you can see here clearly that he actually bends a fire shield for himself. That's the coolest shit in the world! Hi, Princess Yue. I made you something. I carved it myself. It's a bear. Actually, it's supposed to be a fish. So you has a fin. Yeah, Sokka Whittles. I may have mentioned it once or twice. Personally, I would have given her Chipmunk Detective. That one was turning out pretty nice. I shouldn't have asked you to come here. <clears throat> it's pretty funny that even just in the moment, Sokka blames Yue running away on his bad wood carving skills. Master Poophead won't teach her because she's a girl. Why don't you just teach her, Aang? Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't you think of that? Why didn't I think of that? That was amazing! That wasn't me. I was just showing Katara a few moves. You have disrespected me, my teachings, and my entire culture. You are no longer welcome as my student. Drama Queen! In the background of this big old council room thing, you can actually see the symbols for the ocean and the moon. I suspect he might change his mind if you swallow your pride and apologize to him. I'm waiting, little girl. No. No way am I apologizing to a sour old man like you!
Hell yeah! Also, this is the second time we ever see Katara do this emotional waterbending like she did in episode one. Of course, she's deemed a master two episodes from now, so it's cool that she clearly has more control going forward. I'll be outside if you're man enough to fight me. I love the fact that she used the man enough to fight me line. That's like empowering for women, but like I'm a dude and I feel empowered. Come get a fucking taste, Paku. Hey, ever notice how the Fire Nation flag has these little pieces of cloth coming off it to make it look like a flame? I did. I noticed. You're not gonna win this fight. I know. I don't care. Woo! I know I've said the words, I fuck with this energy a few times already, but I fuck with this energy the most out of all energies. I don't care if I'm gonna lose. I'm gonna prove a point. Hell yeah, Katara. You don't have to do this for me. I can find another teacher. I'm not doing it for you. I'm gonna take this moment to talk about Katara and how she's a real fucking character. With just that line, I'm not doing this for you. That gives her more character than a ton of other action show girls. If you like Naruto, sorry, I'm gonna rip your show apart for a second. Hinata and Sakura, what are they about? We know one loves Naruto and we know one loves Sasuke. What else do we know about them? What are their long lasting goals in life? What do they care about? What are their dreams? What do their backstories center around? The answer to all these questions are the guy they have a crush on. Minor spoilers for the halfway point of Naruto here, so skip to this time if you haven't seen it yet. When Pain stabs Hinata, probably killing her, that's supposed to be a big moment, right? Like, oh my god, not Hinata. But to me, it's like, who the fuck are you? I don't care about you. All I know about you is that you like Naruto. You're not a real person. Pan over to Katara. Quick-tempered, can be a little sassy, has a very strong belief in her own moral compass, won't be talked down to, a diligent worker, too quick to trust, still tortured over her mother's death, and lo and behold, a goal. A goal totally removed from the rest of the cast. She wants to be an unreal waterbender. She wants that for herself. That's what makes her feel real. She's not just following the main character around. She has her own goals. She's not head over heels in love with anyone. That's awesome. Just like, thank you for writing a girl that feels like a real person. All right, back to the fight. This fight is unreal. I feel like this is what bending was really leading up to for these first 18 episodes. We finally get to see it. It's fast paced and creative. There's so many cool moves. The ice discs and the ice slide from Paku being the highlights. That being said, there are still a couple weird moments. Katara starting the fight with what seems to be just running at Paku and trying to jump at him is a bit strange. Then not long after she runs up at him and tries to do some kung fu shit. That's really odd from Katara especially. You can't knock me down. By God, she's done it! The waste high wave, snow variation. Someone stop her, she'll kill us all. This is one of the moments that actually got me to start this channel. What actually happens here? We see Paku do the electric slide, curve in towards the guitar, and then hard cut to the necklace on the ground. But if we really slow it down, we can see that I'm pretty sure Paku just slaps the hell out of her with like his front hand. You guys see it? I'm pretty sure this moment is supposed to sell the fact that Katara is fucking skewered to death, but it never got me. Anyone ever get fooled by that? Another small detail about the fight that I like is, despite Katara doing really well, she never lands a hit on Paku. So you could definitely see there's still a wide gap. This is my necklace. On the topic of this necklace again, it's like a really weird thing to hand down, right? I could see if it was from a happy marriage, but Grand Grand got the hell out of Dodge after she was arranged with Paku. We even see that she kept wearing it after she got to the South Pole in a Season 3 flashback. And Paku and Grand Grand seemed to tie the knot pretty quickly again after meeting decades later. But how about a hug for your new grandfather? I'm not sure. The Grand Grand leaving the North Pole because of her arranged marriage theory seems to have a lot of holes to me. But she didn't love you, did she? It was an arranged marriage. Grand Grand wouldn't let your tribe's stupid customs run her life. That's why she left. Yeah, like, does anyone buy that? She kept wearing and made the one symbol of those customs a family heirloom? Even if it's a different betrothal necklace from a guy in the South Pole that she got married to? It's still really weird that she would make Paku's necklace a family heirloom, right? You're a princess, and I'm... I'm just a southern peasant. Forget that, man! Prince Sokka, baby! I do like you. A lot. But we can't be together. And not for the reason you think. It's because... I'm engaged. Oh shit, it's the soap opera moment. For real though, that's a good moment. Plays in with the whole necklace talk and everything through the entire episode. It works. Hey, Katara. What do you think you're doing? It's past sunrise. You're late. This is a pretty quick 180, but with the sentiment that his tribe's backwards ass customs made him lose the love of his life, it might make him rethink his stance on women waterbenders. So I think it works. I mean, plus the fact that Katara did really well in their fight. That probably helped. My fleet is ready. Set a course for the Northern Water Tribe.
Yeah, that's how you sell a finale. That's a pretty good stinger, and it sets the tone for the upcoming two episodes. This episode is great, which is crazy because it's a lot of setup. We're introduced to a whole new side of the Water Tribe, so we have to learn that. Zuko nearly gets assassinated, which leads to his stowing away in Jawa's fleet. We have to learn about Paku and Yue and... Geez, there's a lot. It's a lot of setup. And we need all of this setup because we need the finale to feel effective. But it's weaved so effortlessly with this story about Katara and this personal fight she's having. And I know gender inequality are hot topics nowadays, and I really do think it's great that a show back then had an episode like this, but to me this doesn't feel like women versus men, or even like a woman versus an establishment. It feels like Katara fighting for what's right and what she deserves. It's personal to her, and she feels like a real person. And that's what makes this episode great to me. Alright, obligatory end of episode Patreon stuff. The next episode of Overhand Analyzing Avatar is available over there on Patreon, so if you want to be an entire episode ahead going forward, it's pretty cheap if I do say so myself. Links in the description. Special shoutouts to my top patrons, Code Cannot, Derek Cornwell, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Fritz Sullivan, Garmer, Mana, Nicholas Abbott, Parker Gass, Sean Litchfield, Skylo, Super Snipper, and Tiago Nascimento. Thank you, my absolute boys. Alright, Siege of the North Part 1 next time. That's a big one. See you then.